On January 3rd, 1956, three teenage boys decided to go on a hike near Wattsworth Park, northwest of Great Falls, Montana. While walking along a dirt road, they stumbled upon a car parked between two trees, its engine still running. To their shock, they discovered the lifeless body. The following day, the police made another grim discovery at Vineyard Road, five miles outside of Great Falls, another lifeless body. This mysterious event sparked rumors and speculations surrounding the case with secrets and sinister tales that haunted Great Falls for years. What dark secrets were hidden within the victims' lives? Would the truth ever be revealed? Hello, and welcome back to Mysterious Hook, where we shed light on under-the-radar cases across the country. Today we'll take a look into the twisted case of Dwayne Bogle and Patricia Kalitsky. Great Falls is a city located in Montana known for its scenic beauty and vibrant community. The city is named after the series of waterfalls on the Missouri River, known as the Great Falls of the Missouri. The city offers a mix of natural beauty and urban amenities, with attractions like Giant Spring State Park and River's Edge Trail, and it is here that today's story takes place. But first, let's start from the very beginning. Dwayne Bogle was born on January 18, 1937, in Waco, Texas. His parents, James George Bogle Jr. and Albuquerque Walker, welcomed him with open arms. Dwayne was a high school graduate from Waco and was adored by his family for his charming personality and great sense of humor. As fate would have it, Dwayne's journey took him to the U.S. Air Force in 1955. Fresh-faced and full of ambition, it was likely his first assignment after completing basic training and technical school. He was stationed at Malmstrom Air Force Base in Montana. For eight months, he served as an airman second class near the charming town of Great Falls. Little did he know that during his time there, he would meet the love of his life. Patricia Kalitsky was born on August 20th, 1939, in the small town of Great Falls. She was a junior at Great Falls High School, and her classmates thought she was funny, caring, and full of energy. She always had a big smile on her face. Patricia seemed to be talented in everything she attempted, including ballet and tap dancing. In December 1955, 16-year-old Patricia crossed paths with 18-year-old Duane. They both shared a passion for dancing and singing, and as fate would have it, Duane fell head over heels for Patricia while stationed at Maelstrom. Their connection was instant, and despite knowing each other for only a few weeks, they couldn't bear to be apart and dreamt of a future together. Patricia's family welcomed Duane with open arms, and during Christmas of 1955, he even stayed at their home becoming a part of their festivities. On that eventful day, January 2, 1956, Dwayne and Patricia embarked on a journey to Wattsworth Park, full of joy and anticipation. They said goodbye to their families, brimming with excitement for their very first trip together as a couple. Little did they know that this adventure would soon take an unforeseen turn, altering the course of their lives forever. They had planned to be back home by 9 p.m., but as the hours ticked away, Patricia's parents grew increasingly concerned. Patricia, known for her responsible and punctual nature, had failed to return by her usual 10 p.m. curfew. Frantic with worry, Patricia's parents reached out to her older sister, hoping for any clue of her whereabouts. But Patricia was nowhere to be found. They scoured the familiar places where Patricia liked to spend her time, yet she remained elusive. As their search grew more desperate, a troubling possibility crept into their minds. Could Patricia have followed in her sister's footsteps and eloped with Duane? Having already experienced the pain of betrayal from their elder daughter, as years back she too eloped with her lover, they reluctantly believed the notion that history might be repeating itself. Fearing the worst but burdened by their past heartbreak, they hesitated to involve the police. Unsure if Patricia had willingly vanished, or if something more sinister had occurred. On a cold January 3, 1956, three adventurous boys went for a hike near Wattsworth Park in northwest Great Falls, Montana. As they walked along a dusty path, they came across a strange and unsettling sight. There was a car, 
parked between two trees, still running with the radio playing loudly. Its headlights were still on, and the emergency brake was on. It seemed like the driver had vanished just moments before. Fueled by curiosity, the boys cautiously approached the vehicle. To their shock, they discovered a lifeless man lying face down, partially trapped under the vehicle. They noticed that his hands had been tightly bound behind his back, using what looked like his own belt. The boys immediately alerted the authorities, who wasted no time in rushing to the scene to investigate. They carefully scoured the entire area, being careful not to disturb any potential evidence. During their examination of the body, they found a gunshot wound to the back of the man's head. Surprisingly, there were no other signs of injury on his body. This suggested that the killer's only motive was to end his life swiftly, without prolonging his suffering. As the police searched the car, they stumbled upon a crucial piece of identification, a driver's license belonging to an eight-year-old man named Dwayne Bogle, which provided a vital lead in the case. The police minds raced with theories, one of which was robbery. The car's engine was still running, indicating a swift getaway by the killer after snatching valuables. But then they had a terrifying suspicion. They believed that something more sinister than just robbery had occurred. At that time, kidnappings were occurring frequently, which raised concerns that Duane might have been deliberately chosen as a target. It appeared that the perpetrator's original plan had gone terribly wrong, resulting in the tragic decision to end Duane's life. The police were determined to find any clue so they carefully searched every corner of the area. However, the predator had managed to cover his tracks completely, leaving no evidence behind. The police then contacted Dwayne's family and shared the devastating news of his murder. When Dwayne's parents received the shocking information, they were overwhelmed with disbelief and sorrow. They couldn't comprehend how someone could harm their beloved son, who was always full of joy and loved by everyone. It was an incredibly heart-wrenching moment for them. Upon hearing the news, Patricia's worried parents stepped forward and shared crucial information with the police. They revealed that Patricia was also with Dwayne and hadn't returned home either. Concerned for her safety, they expressed their fear that if Dwayne had been killed, then where was Patricia? The police were puzzled because during their initial investigation at the crime scene, there were no signs of Patricia nearby. Determined to find her, they returned to the scene and intensified their search. It was on the following day, January 4, 1956, that Patricia's lifeless body was discovered by a road worker along Vineyard Road, five miles outside of Great Falls. The grim location was nearly eight miles away from where Duane's body had been found. It was evident that Patricia had likely been kidnapped. Tragically, a trail of blood leading down the rocky ravine, indicated that her body had rolled to the spot on the gravel road above. Like Dwayne, she had also suffered a gunshot wound to the back of her head. Little did the authorities know, this was just the beginning of a twisted and chilling mystery. The police decided to investigate the sequence of events and gather information about Patricia and Dwayne's last known movements. They discovered that the couple had been seen together at Pete's drive-in restaurant enjoying a drink on the evening of January 2nd, 1956. According to the restaurant staff, they arrived at 8.30 p.m. and left shortly after 9. They were alone in the car during their visit. The location where Duane and his car were found was known as a popular spot for couples, leading the police to believe that Patricia and Duane had driven there willingly. It seemed that their killer had come across them at that spot and forced them out of the vehicle. Authorities firmly believed that Dwayne and Patricia had fallen victim to the same perpetrator, given the striking similarities in their deaths. The unsettling circumstances pointed to a chilling execution-style killing, where both victims were forced to kneel before being fatally shot in the back of the head. As the investigation progressed, a chilling detail emerged. Patricia's body discovered at the bottom of a rocky ravine was fully clothed, except for a single missing shoe that was never found, which had slipped off as she rolled down the embankment. The initial examination of her body also provided no conclusive evidence of assault. However, as the investigation deepened, a 
surprising twist emerged. The results of further testing and examination painted a completely different picture. The revelation came when injuries consistent with assault were discovered on Patricia's body, contradicting the initial assessment. They were also able to take a swab from her that they hoped would help identify the killer. Unfortunately, the technological limitations of the time prevented any conclusive findings. However, all the testing reports and evidence were carefully preserved for future breakthroughs that could unravel the mystery. The coroner's assessment added another layer of intrigue. It was believed that Dwayne had actually clung to life for several hours after being shot. The shooting itself was estimated to have taken place sometime between 10 p.m. and midnight, and Dwayne's tragic demise occurred between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. Authorities were dedicated to identifying the killer, and they launched a massive investigation. Sheriff T.J. Leeper from the Great Falls Sheriff's Office went the extra mile by using his own money to buy a polygraph machine that could potentially unlock vital clues. They called in an expert from Seattle to ensure its proper use. A team of 10 officers devoted themselves to the case, working day and night. The search began for anyone with the potential motive to harm either Dwayne or Patricia, as the net of suspicion widened. Patricia's mother, Katherine, shared a concerning conversation she had with Dwayne the day before his lifeless body was found on January 2, 1956. Dwayne seemed troubled, and Katherine, being a caring mother, asked him what was bothering him. Dwayne revealed that he had been upset about a recent argument he had with a friend from Texas. This piece of information piqued the authorities' interest, as they wondered if this friend could be connected to Patricia and Dwayne's murder. Somehow they tracked down the friend and questioned him for four hours. Eventually the police had to release him when they couldn't find any evidence linking him to the murders. Moreover, he was proven to be in his Texas home at the time of the murder. Frustratingly, the police couldn't find a clear personal motive behind the murders of Dwayne and Patricia. This roadblock narrowed their investigation options, so they shifted their focus to the people who had been out drinking on the night of the murders and also tried to identify the individuals who kept guns with them. Just when things seemed bleak, two witnesses emerged with a surprising piece of information. On January 10, 1956, they informed the police about a man who not only possessed a gun, but was also seen returning to his house around midnight, clutching the weapon in his hand. This information sparked a glimmer of hope, that they might have finally caught a break in the case, but their hope quickly faded. When they confronted the person and spoke with him, he vehemently denied leaving his house that night and claimed to not even own a gun. The police's suspicions were nearly enough to arrest him based on the testimony of the two men. However, in a shocking turn of events, the witnesses eventually confessed after hours of intense questioning. It turned out that they had been lying all along. Driven by their deep hatred for the man, they saw this ongoing investigation as an opportunity to fulfill their desire for revenge. This revelation left the police stunned and frustrated, realizing that they were back to square one in their search for the true culprit. After two months in March 1956, Sheriff Leeper had to end the full-time inquiry into the case without identifying the killer. The lack of progress was disheartening for the sheriff, who expressed his frustration and regret for not catching the person responsible for the deaths of Patricia and Dwayne. The investigation continued, but after a year, on the one-year anniversary of the murders in January 1957, the sheriff spoke to the Great Falls Tribune. He shared his determination to keep going, saying, I guess it's just one of those things, but we're not giving up. Maybe this year we'll catch them. He must have made a mistake. They all do. Someday we'll find out what it was, and then we'll have them. The deaths of Duane and Patricia had a deep impact on their families and the communities they belonged to. Patricia's father, Henry, became emotionally numb and found it incredibly difficult to acknowledge Patricia's death. Patricia's sister, Darlene, 
shared in an interview with the television show Hard Copy that their father Henry couldn't bring himself to talk about Patricia or cope with the loss. In order to find solace, Darlene chose to cherish the happy memories she had with her sister. Despite the pain, both families knew that nothing could bring Patricia and Dwayne back. The loss was so difficult to comprehend, and finding closure seemed like a distant possibility. Patricia's mother, Kathleen, shared that she and Dwayne's mother exchanged letters for years after the murder. Their correspondence served as a way for the two families to connect, united by the tragedy and grief they experienced. All the while, the case had been cold. In 2001, Detective Phil Madison joined the investigation into Dwayne and Patricia's murder with a fresh approach. He discovered a swab taken from Patricia's autopsy that had been stored as evidence for over 45 years. With advancements in DNA technology, the swab was sent to the Montana State Police Crime Lab for analysis. Shockingly, the lab found a cell in the swab that did not belong to Duane, confirming that Patricia had been assaulted. Authorities spent the next few years comparing the DNA from the cell to more than 35 suspects previously identified. However, none of the suspects' DNA matched the one found on the swab. The investigators also checked the DNA found on the swab against national criminal databases, but no match was found. They looked into suspects such as James Whitey Bulger, a notorious mobster from Boston who had lived in the Great Falls area during the time of the murders. Bulger had a previous arrest for assaulting a 15-year-old girl in 1951. Another potential suspect was Edward Wayne, a convicted serial killer who had murdered two couples years after Duane and Patricia's death. The police thought he might have been in the Great Falls area during that time, but he denied any involvement. Both Bulger and Wayne were ruled out as suspects when their DNA did not match the DNA found on the swab. The investigation went on for another 18 years until a breakthrough emerged. Inspired by the technique used in solving the Golden State Killer case in 2018, Detective Sergeant John Cadneron, who was assigned to the case of Patricia and Dwayne's murder, had a strong determination to take the investigation forward. He teamed up with forensic scientists to gather more DNA evidence from the swab taken during Patricia's autopsy. In 2019, they adopted a cutting-edge method called genetic genealogy using bow technology. This innovative technique allowed forensic genealogists to compare the DNA profile found at the crime scene with profiles in public genealogical databases. By analyzing the shared DNA, they were able to uncover distant relatives and construct a family tree. It was like solving a puzzle, connecting the dots between different individuals and their genetic ties. With the meticulous construction of the family tree, the investigators were on the verge of unmasking the suspect. However, there was a chilling twist in the story. The prime suspect had already passed away, and his remains had been cremated, making it impossible to obtain a direct DNA sample from him. Undeterred, they turned their attention to the suspect's children, who resided near Great Falls, and requested their DNA for a comparison. To their surprise, the DNA from the children confirmed that their father was the source of the cell found during Patricia's autopsy. It was a devastating realization for the children to discover that their beloved father was responsible for the death of two people. On June 8, 2021, the Cascade County Sheriff's Office officially announced the identity of the perpetrator in Patricia and Duane's murder as Kenneth Gould, who also lived in Great Falls. After thorough investigation and confirmation through DNA analysis, the authorities strongly believed that Kenneth Gould was the one responsible for the murders of Patricia and Dwayne. However, since Gould had already passed away, he could not face a trial or be officially named as the killer. Instead, they could only label him as the most likely suspect in the case. This groundbreaking announcement came more than 65 years after Patricia and Dwayne's tragic deaths marking it as the oldest case in the world ever solved using the innovative technique of genetic genealogy. Kenneth Gould, a local horse trainer, had spent his early years in Great Falls, Montana. 
He got married in 1952 when he was 24 years old to 16-year-old Lulabelle Brown and started a family raising five children. Surprisingly, he lived just a short distance from Patricia's house and was frequently seen riding horses in the area at the time of the murder. Despite his proximity to the crime scene, Gould's name never appeared in the police files and there was no apparent connection between him and Dwayne or Patricia. Curiously, a month after the murders in February 1956, Gould sold his family property and embarked on a series of moves across Montana, eventually settling in Missouri in 1967. From that point on, he never returned to Montana. Gould's journey came to an end in 2001 when he passed away in Oregon County, Missouri, at the age of 79. His life remained intertwined with the mystery of Patricia and Dwayne's murders, leaving unanswered questions about his possible involvement and the reason behind the murders. Speaking about the case, Detective Sergeant John Cadner from the Cascade County Sheriff's Office mentioned that people can have secrets they never tell anyone. Because a lot of time had passed between the murders and Gould being identified, many of Patricia and Dwayne's loved ones had already passed away and couldn't hear the news. Patricia's only surviving sister, Darlene, had advanced dementia when Gould was finally identified. The resolution of the case evoked various emotions within Dwayne and Patricia's family. Although they were relieved to finally have answers, Gould's identification brought back memories and reopened old emotional wounds among the relatives. Dwayne's niece, Karen Bogle McCarthy, expressed her thoughts to the New York Times, saying that the use of modern technology in solving the case was beneficial for her generation. Karen was the daughter of Dwayne's younger brother, James Jim Bogle, who had always looked up to Dwayne while growing up. Unfortunately, Jim didn't live long enough to witness the identification of his beloved brother's killer, as he passed away in November 2013 due to a neurodegenerative disease. Patricia and Dwayne's surviving family felt a great sense of relief as they no longer had to deal with the wild speculations and strange theories surrounding the case. One theory that deeply upset Dwayne's family was the belief that he had become involved with the mob in Great Falls, leading to their tragic deaths. There were also rumors suggesting Dwayne's involvement with drug dealers in Texas. However, Gould's identification not only revealed the truth about who took Dwayne away from his family, but it also put an end to decades of speculation and rumors. While closure has been found, the emotional wounds remain for the families affected by this tragedy. What are your thoughts on this case? What do you think could be the possible motive for Dwayne and Patricia's murder? We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to drop your recommendations in the comments section below. And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled for the next mystery to unfold.